Welcome to the CF Working Group of Archives, uh, the panel that is on um, archives, access, ethics, and fraud. Well, uh, probably we can uh, skip uh, the, the, the subject of fraud because that, that was uh, a, a subject of, of one person and he went to another panel anyway. So we, um, yeah. Um, the, the panel is uh, on um, how should traditional and especially also digital archives deal with matters of access and ethics? What can be put online for free? How to deal with copyright and privacy and what to do with controversial material? So this is the afternoon session. We already had a morning session uh, that went very well. Um, Ava Gorcic is my uh, co-convener, but she is on maternal leave and it's not uh, certain if she will come online. But, um, okay, let's um, go to the afternoon session where we have three presentations and a general discussion if needs be. Uh, and all the presentations will be, I hope, uh, uh, more or less uh, for 25 minutes. Um, that's including some uh, question and answers. And the first one in this afternoon session to speak, and now I probably will mispronounce his name uh, at least a little, is Jerky Borisa. Uh, okay. Okay, <laughs> good enough. <laughs> okay. Uh, of the University of Eastern Finland. And uh, the title of his presentation is Secondary Analysis of Research Materials from the Point of View of Folklore Archives. Because in folklore archives, of course, we uh, reuse uh, some material that has been collected in the past. And what can we learn from this practice? The first presentation is by Jurki and um, the screen is yours now. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you fine. Okay, fine. I'm sitting in Rus Russia in Sortavala, <laughs> Vakkosalmi Park, and I might be running out of electricity from my computer. So I will come back with my telephone then. But I tried to get this my presentation made here. And I, I tried to, to, to share something with you let's see how it goes uh, the uh, the idea of this uh, it's uh, not so much it's also about digitized materials and all th those problems but i i tried to write an article about these questions of uh, uh, changing uh, uses of archives and cha changing users of archives and the next slide is important if i drop <laughs> down so remember this because I think this is the what I found out so far, and I, I, I uh, it is a project we made made for Finnish Academy we, where we try to to see archives in a new way, some somewhat and and and, and I think the Maria Tampuku sociologist from London, you know her very well, I guess so. I think her enthusiastic uh, views about reading archive materials and, 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 and archive texts was some kind of impetus for this whole whole thing. And I was thinking about as I have been working in folklore archive for for 14 years and I, I think it's it has become maybe a little bit routinized work, but still I I also feel that enthusiasm, but I was inter interested when someone outside of this typical humanistic archive users uh, comes to archive and how she sees the experience of reading the text and i think it's something it's interesting it's it's opposite of digital materials having those texts in paper in front of you and 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 having what kind of experiences you get when you uh, uh, walk into the archive hall and sit down there and, and so on so i think it's a it's very interesting approach. Uh, it's a kind of materiality of archives and archive notes. 
So the second one I found I out, which is very important, is in I think in oral history, they have been writing recently quite a lot about the ethical problems of using oral history interviews in a new way. And I, uh, uh, John Bornard, which who who also must be well known among you, she's. She has written about an example she met in an oral history conference when someone was asking about the problem when someone was using oral history interviews in a totally new way and, and in a way which would have been for the, those people interviewed very, very embarrassing. And, and in Finland, I think we have this kind of example. I also as a folklorist look a little bit... Uh, with uh, some kind of uh, difficulties when a historian Siltala he wrote about men's trauma traumas on the base of life history interviews uh, saved in, in Finnish folklore archives and I think in in many cases even though you don't have the names there and, and you don't you only take short short parts of the interviews for for those who are talking they know their own topics very easily and and the problem is that when they are set in a totally different context like in context of trauma or context or some kind of mental il illness for example and people have been interviewed on on a totally different base maybe about their life histories it's a it's a it, it is really an ethical problem so the third case is about the new regulations when we ap apply for money from the Finnish Academy in Finland. We have to have this kind of archive plans where we put those, how we archive our materials and where we put them. And I think it, it, it is very in interesting and important. It has, for the newer generations, it has been many times a quite a problematic situation. They don't know. They feel it's too too... Uh, harsh to uh, they have to know too much about what they are going to have uh, even before the process starts and then the last one is also important I think it's so uh, when the especially when the interviewing generations get old and old researchers die so lots of material are, are, are kept at, at their own homes or at workplaces and when they are empty the workrooms are emptied so people find piles of um, tapes there, and and what to do with these? And 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 I'm I'm quite sure that if they have been recorded 30 years ago, there is no informed consent regarding this kind of material. So these are maybe the basic situations, and I think it's very interesting that how these new users and new problems how they affect affect our if i think myself a little bit archive person which i'm not anymore our our practices of of thinking and using archives and that's why i i changed my title a little bit that it's not about folklore archive but it's folklore studies and i think it could be about all empirical studies who are using archives the the, the same problem is there with everybody and and it is, of course, it's interesting to look at the differences between huma humanistic sciences or human humanistic studies, like history or folklore studies, which have been very long time using archives and, and feel they know what to do with archive materials and, and see this uh, latest ethical problematics only as a, some kind of a short short time uh, something short time uh, uh, tornado maybe there but but not not something uh, changing the the basic of you basics of using archives and reasons for archives and when when someone totally new to archives come comes to archive like in social sciences or in pedagogical sciences archives have not used been used so much so i think it's very interesting to compare these things how we see see and what kind of problems we see and in an article proposal i have made about this i i i studied two two such kind of 
points. Uh, one was about the context. How, how, what, what do we mean with context? And are, are, do we have enough context or are there contexts missing? And the other one is about the ethical problems, which already have been discussed quite a lot here today, I think so. And which uh, mo mostly come to archive people's uh, table when, when new people or, or old people are coming with old new rules to use the archive materials. So, so at, uh, if, if I, I jump to, to this contextual issues because this ethical issues, it's interesting that we, I think we have to have some kind of good solutions and not, not to be in need to destroy all those old materials found in the corners of old researchers, because I think it's a kind of cultural heritage when we, when we um, uh, have made some interviews 30 or 40 years ago, go, and even if we don't have the modern type of con con consent in, in, for, in form, or even if there are some often very problematic topics which could maybe not, not be deal today, so we should have have some possibility not not to destroy this material but save it somehow and how how to do that so it's very interesting and i think they have in in, the, in finland for example there has been a, a cooperation with the tampere based uh, uh, social sciences archive which just now has changed its name to knowledge archive and, and, and its field to folklore, uh, field to humanities and social science studies, which is also a kind of remark, remark of this changing living situation. So I have to hit some animals from my computer. So, so uh, I, I, I just named name this contextual issue. I, I just put it here. Oh, okay, maybe a little bit behind the ethical worries. So, if if we think about them, so when I was working in archive, uh, it was very evident. And when when I read this uh, field document transcriptions of field in in the in the use, so they were were very uh, difficult. Uh, um evaluations of persons who were uh -huh. interviewed so that that kind of evaluations would never be possible today and then about these new demands for archiving they give this new ethical worries and 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 the older new users and uses of archive materials and i think also history has changed a little bit i think in in history studies in earlier times there was no discussion about the ethical questions, and maybe people thought that there there are no such questions if it has a long time frame between the the time of when the material was born and when it is used, and and then the, I think one of the it's a very practical problem the easiness of keeping everything to one oneself and also it, it is a kind of saving own research ideas from the other research and, and the need to now to put it in archives and in everybody's use. It, it has also changed the, this ethical field of ethical questions now. I don't have any, any answers, but, but I think this is, this, this kind of problems are rising there. So, so this is a little bit, but do I still have time? <laughs> Uh, it, it looks like I, I have. Okay, this is yes, uh, one. Still have time. Yeah, uh, this is just about the context. So I, I, I read through my my paper proposal, and I, I think in folklore studies uh, in 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 sixties uh, the the idea of field work in in Norwegian countries it it made the young researchers to think that archive materials are. Uh, almost shit or something which don't have any contextual information and the field field research produces the contextual information and for example in nefa nordic ethnologic folkloristic <laughs> association or something arbets group 
uh, had a field trip in Finland in Möri 1968, and, and the publication from this field trip is very important. And there is an inter interesting ar article about context, context frog or contextual questions by Juha Pentikainen, where I think there's a real example of how many things you should ask about context in the field if you really want to know everything about where some kind of folklore item is used and how it is used and how it is understood. And on the base of this critic of archives, I think 30 years when, went on, or at least 20 years, when the archives were downplayed very much and they, people were not interested to use the old archive materials. And it is true that Before that time, the archives were made for different use. They were made for international com comparison and, and the card files and, and the separation of variants from the original. I, I use the word sendings. I don't know what is the original letters from from the co-operators. Uh, they were the folklore items were put aside and and put in the index. And I, I think it made a picture of folklore, a certain kind of contextless reality or something like that. And I think the field study people were right in that way that it's very different in the field when you see something sang or, or told. But but anyhow, I think they were wrong in that, that it's it's also possible to to build different kind of context to that kind of archive materials. and. and Uh, now it has not been discussed this kind of uh, problem anymore in, after 1990s, I think so. So if I say the last word about this comparison. If it's, I think it's interesting to see how the social scientists who are talking about the new uses or needs for archive are, are talking about. They are discussing under this context question more about the missing information about the research context, the researchers and the questions, which is evidently very important to know. No, I think in, in folklore studies, we don't, in many cases, we don't ask us or someone else about what, what is the research, research question behind the folklore archive in the archive. It is just folklore and it is archive as such without any research questions. So that is just one example how I think it's it could be useful to compare these. But at the same time, I think the in both fields or in any any fields of uses of archives, the situation is changing all the time, and the digital archives are giving a new impetus to this whole soup of so many different uh, views. So <laughs> I, I can give you any any more clear clear thing now but i think it's really interesting questions so how, how archives will be used in the future so thank you <laughs> okay thank you um and i see one question uh, could you stop sharing yes okay wonderful and i already saw, saw one um And Nicholas, did you want to say, is it, oh, you're uh, just applauding, I suppose. Are there uh, any questions or remarks? Um, can I? Yes, you can. I don't have the sign of Uh, putting my hand up, so that's why I just okay. jumped up. Um, uh, it's only a comment to, to say I really liked your presentation and that uh, I uh, I, found, I find useful these uh, archival plans um, along with our ethical considerations in projects. They are difficult to make, but they might be really useful for uh, well of course nobody knows who no, nobody knows who, what the project will be and it's very difficult to decide before um, in before the, the the field but at least think about it it's it, it's useful I guess 
And thank you. You made me think about a lot of things. Yeah. I, I think when I was telling people who were starting their projects that it's a, it's a very useful to at, at the be beginning to, to try to, to get a picture of what you are trying to get and, and maybe already to find some kind of idea for how, how it will be indexed and so and how it will be archived because then you get the archive signs or indexes for your materials before you start writing your articles and books and it helps a lot lot you lot of lot <laughs> okay thank you um any more questions or remarks No, okay, thanks, Jirki. Um, Thank you. We're going to move on to the next speaker. Uh, that's Karol Shiba from the University of Prague of the Czech Republic. And um, the title of his presentation is Archiving the Subcultures, What Works and What Doesn't. And I believe the sub... Um, the subcultures involve, amongst others, uh, punk and metal subcultures, uh, both in uh, Czech and Slovak subcultures. So we're very interested uh, what you have to say on infrastructure, technology, access, and ethics. Um, the screen is yours, Cairo. Thank you very much, uh, Theo. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, and um, I would like to uh, um, present today, actually, I'm not an archivist, uh, but I would like to present uh, my uh, experience uh, or, or in fact, uh, our collective experience with uh, archiving uh, subcultures. Um, uh, here we have uh, uh, outline of the presentation. I would like to start with a with short uh, or brief uh, 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 introduction on, on our archive of Czech and Slovak subcultures, then introduce our uh, research project that we had on, on, on the Czech and Slovak uh, uh, subcultures and, and alternative scenes. And then I will discuss uh, uh, the questions uh, that uh, are um, important for for this session i i suppose uh that uh i hope uh, it will be interesting also for 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 this group of people because i think we 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 deal with with similar questions uh, as as the others and we have uh, uh different experiences with with uh, thinking about archiving in different contexts uh and i will discuss uh these questions within kind of three paradigms which actually came to, to our mind during uh, the collecting materials and so on as, as archive library and collection and I will then uh, uh, conclude with uh, our I would say compromise between these uh, paradigms. Um, so first what, what we uh, actually uh, archive uh, yeah uh, subcultures uh, 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 in Czech and Slovak context, uh, it does mean mostly uh, punk, uh, uh, also metal, but skinhead, also uh, subculture, uh, uh, environmentalist uh, and anarchist, uh, and feminist. Of course, uh, uh, this is also this was uh, the feminist movement uh, in 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 the uh, age of nineties was was largely uh, 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 you know the, the part of the feminism was was subcultural. Uh, uh, riot girl movement uh, uh for example so um these are uh, the most of the materials we we have collected are, are zins and fanzines but we have also uh posters uh, uh for example some badges and 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 these kind of material that uh um is used uh within these uh, uh communities uh as a, as a kind of uh, a symbolic signs of of belonging to the uh, to the community, um, so uh, I will focus mostly on the on the zins. So, in uh, what what are they? Uh, uh, zins or fun zins are non commercial, non professional, small circulation magazines that uh, their creators produce, publish, and distribute by themselves. So, it's uh, mostly about uh, it's it's 
co almost completely about do-it-yourself activities, uh, bottom-up activities, uh, and uh, enthusiastic um, approach to publishing uh, 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 magazines or or different kind of of uh, um, uh, published uh, uh, documents. Um, we uh, uh, several years ago we started to collect these materials uh, independently. I have to say, uh, uh, and and build a kind of group of people, also with background in the subcultures in Czech Republic and, and Slovak Republic, and we uh, uh, decided to to build uh, something like archive. Uh, we didn't think much about what does it mean uh, uh, the archive, but we. Um, thought that it it would be good to uh, and and valuable to to because uh, be valuable to collect it and and to make it somehow uh, um, open uh, for public uh, and uh, because because as we think uh, this is also a part of of cultural heritage uh, 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 today even if it's, it's relatively new uh, 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 it's just. Uh, Th three or four decades old the subcultures usually um but uh, uh most of the materials we have uh, come from uh, uh 1990s but also 80s and uh and and uh, 40s uh, uh this is uh, uh uh of course uh the reason is that mm, in 80s uh, czech and slovak uh, uh, republics were uh, czechoslovak communist czechoslovakia and it wasn't possible actually uh, uh legally to publish uh, an independent uh, or subcultural material so there is a little uh, uh material from the 80s but there was uh, the boom of subcultures uh, during 90s um and there is a lot of printed material from 90s and then of course came the internet and and uh, uh so most of the uh, most of the communication went online so uh then we we see that some we we lose uh, uh the printed materials uh so we um uh, we started to to digitize uh, these materials uh, 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 in a kind of do-it-yourself uh, way, uh, and we uh, uh, tried to uh, um, to make them accessible in a certain way. Uh, and we started to discuss how to do it. We established uh, our online database. Uh, you see uh, zini uh, dot info with some uh, information, and we've been working on that for for I would say five years now. We have, for example, met with with uh, the the place of origin of the of the fanzines, uh, and we have the list with some uh, 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 metadata. Uh, for now, we have uh, uh, digitized kind of two and a half thousand uh, issues, and we also did. Uh, interviews with the creators and readers and so on and th this was possible uh, just because we we got a research grant uh, uh part of the groups are academics uh so uh we we uh got it from the czech science foundation in 2017 and we we uh, our aim was really uh, to analyze but also to map the zin cultures uh in in uh, during the last uh, three decades uh, in in Czech and uh, Slovak contexts, um, and we have so uh, he had also, of course, research questions uh, concerning the 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 sociality which uh, comes together with uh, uh, subcultures, and so uh, concerning the materiality of 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 the life of subcultures and so on. But I would not go into detail by risk questions uh now we all uh, tried to to put together people who who uh, uh are archive uh, uh uh who built uh, archives or collections of zines and fanzines uh, uh uh across the europe and and organized international conference and we we uh, uh really uh um and had a valuable uh, debates with people who uh, do it uh, uh, from uh, kind of from bottom up uh, in in Germany, in United States, France, Poland, and other uh, more uh, countries. And we we are uh, al already published some uh, uh, outcomes of of the project. But uh, come back to our carving su subcultures. What is uh, actually the challenges we see? Uh, uh, here, uh, after these years of, of, of doing this, is that uh, 
the, uh, subcultures and, 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 and alternative scenes are, are uh, non-institutionalized networks of, of independent uh, people or activists and, and publishers. Um, they uh, uh, use uh, almost exclusively do-it-yourself practices, uh, very, which are very various, uh, ephemeral and, and uh, uh, unstable. Uh, and these communities are informal uh, and, and they are usually positioned themselves as uh, oppositional uh, uh, alternative or even even more radically uh, politically uh, oppositional, uh, including uh, some illegal actions uh, 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 mm, uh, and especially in, in our case in, in Czechoslovak code context in during 90s, the subcultures were highly politicized uh, you know, on, on both uh, uh, um, uh, uh, sides of this political spectrum, uh, the radical left anarchists and, and the ra radical right uh, skinhead uh, subcultures were uh, pol politicized. So, so in that uh, case, we also deal with a lot of materials that uh, I would say are is punishable or uh, is uh, um, uh, could, could be used for for uh, criminal cases. Uh, uh, I, I will now discuss these uh, um, the approach we 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 have uh, we we used uh, in a kind of uh, based on three questions: what are in institutional infrastructures that enabled archiving of subcultures? What are technologies and procedures, and what are impact? And what kind of access to the data is possible in terms of technology, legal regulations, and ethics? And uh, these questions, I will uh, 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 try to not answer but but just to to give some comments on that uh in in three par paradigms because we realized that actually the, the, the fanzines as independent magazines could be uh, collected maintained uh published uh and so on not only in in the kind of archival uh approach in 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 a narrow mm -hmm. sense but also uh in a, in a uh uh, uh, what, what what is usually uh, thought of as a library or as a, as a collection uh, uh private or, or community-based. So I will start with, with how do we think about archiving uh, subcultures uh, within the paradigm of archive uh, uh, in a narrow sense. So in, we, we uh, actually, uh, uh, yeah, we have uh, our historians, uh, uh, the, um, um, uh, a lot of uh, people of, of the group. So we have had experience with archives. We, we thought, uh, okay, uh, if we uh, uh, think about these materials within uh, the infrastructure of archives in Czech Republic, Slovak Republic, uh, Republic, it's it's a uh, we have dense network of state, local, or specialized uh, uh, archives. Uh, uh, but it's a highly uh, regulated uh, uh, um, environment. Uh, that the Czech law on archives and records is is. Uh, Quite strict uh, in in regulation on composition and operation of archives, uh, and and the access is of course limited uh, to thirty years uh, uh, limit uh, uh, with with uh, uh, strict protection of personal data. Of course, I will not start the debate about GDPR now, but it's uh, also national legislation, um, and uh, we have some exceptions. Uh, because the post-communist country that some archives are more open uh, uh, state security archive is uh, 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 is is accessible quite quite uh, uh, good but but all of these other archives are uh, 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 highly regulated uh, uh, as far as digit digitization of of within these archival uh, infrastructure is concerned uh, it's uh, of course state uh, of uh, funded funded by the state uh, but in in uh, uh, it's funded in a limited way and so so the scope of, uh, of digitization is very uh, uh, very limited and and uh, most of the materials that are digitized within archives are are kind of older popular historical sources records of of uh, uh, births and marriages and so on. Uh, so uh, that was that would be quite little uh, a chance to to have digitized these our materials within some any established uh, archival institution, even even uh, university institution uh, archive and, and so on. 
uh, internationally, there are uh, there are uh, um, in independent archives um, that focus on subcultures. We have uh, a good uh, contact and, and cooperation with the uh, 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 Archiv der Jugendkulturen in Berlin and and, and in German uh, in Germany. There is an initiative to uh, 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 to to put together people who do archiving of new social movements or show social movements in general, and and they I think they they uh, came with. Uh, quite uh, interesting ideas to how to do it independently. Um, uh, the second library in paradigm. Uh, this is actually in when we take it globally, it, it's most common. Uh, it's uh, 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 especially in the United States. There's a lot of uh, uh, library uh, collections of of zins uh, uh, there. And uh, even uh, the uh, Zen librarians uh, uh, establish a network, uh, uh, but also Zins are uh, present in, in, in different uh, uh, public libraries, British library, and so on, uh, and, uh, uh, and libraries of NGOs and independent activist centers. Um, uh, there are some attempts to digitization of, of these uh, library correct, uh, collections, um, but in fact, um, in a, a, within this paradigm, the, the, the main question uh, is how to catalog or, or, or uh, how to build metadata and, uh, 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 and uh, uh, how to make possible to access it. Uh, uh, there are different ways of uh, cataloging uh, uh, fanzines. One example uh, come from um, the US group of, of uh, Zin librarians, for example, uh, uh, published under Creative Commons. Uh, uh, and the access is mainly the question about about uh, uh, copyright and intellectual property rights, but it's very difficult uh, within uh, uh, subculture materials because there are different strategies how to mock uh, copyright. For example, if you see now uh, different versions of copyright from fanzines, it's copy left, it's anti copyright. You know, it's even uh, 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 sentences like "If you steal this, I'll seriously kill you." So, so uh, the copyright is just really not uh, uh, so simple uh, uh, within the subcultures and and the material from the subculture, and and so. Uh, but sometimes it's it's completely free. Sometimes it's uh, Creative Commons, and so we uh, uh, it's it's a quite complicated question. Uh, so, so so the U.S. group of of librarians came with the code of ethics: how to work with uh, 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 zines and fanzines, how to collect them, or or how to make them uh, available uh, for public. Uh, so it's also uh, interesting and inspiring here. Uh, and, and the third one, actually, we came out of the collector's paradigm. We, we started to collect uh, uh, independently. So these are usually private, and there are, there are really hundreds of, of uh, uh, globally, hundreds of private collections or community-based co collections. Uh, usually people, insiders uh, uh, from the scenes uh, do this work, but there is also a market uh, um, among collectors uh, about rare copies, for example. Uh, so this is mostly individual voluntary uh, 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 enthusiastic work, um, uh, which of course comes with lack of resources, personal, financial, technical. So these uh, um, initiatives are usually very unstable and use low-cost technologies. You, usually you can find some websites uh, um, here um, with blogs and uh, and databases, I, I give you uh, some examples. There are actually no, of course, clear rules or regulations uh, here. Uh, uh, the owners of, of, of the of the collections just decide what to do with it. Uh, some 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 people just don't bother with any you know issues, uh, even ethical issues or or, or, or uh, copyright issues. They just publish uh, uh, it online and and. Uh, yeah, and uh, so these are very, you know, different uh, approaches here, and and but this approach has a quite uh, a, a big advantage, uh, uh, and it, it's what uh, Katie Icorn uh, uh, called a high archival proximity to 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 the creators uh, of the material. Uh, uh, it enables uh, kind of shared ownership and trust between the people who who, uh, who uh, uh, donate the material uh, or scanned copies and so on. Now, I will summarize very briefly. Um, 
So in, in case of in, uh, in, infrastructure or organization, archive, uh, when they think about archiving subcultures, it's, uh, archives are mostly public, but they have rigid like legal regulation from my po our point of view. And the people from uh, subcultures uh, 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 quite a lot distrust uh, 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 these institutions. You know, it's, it's quite hard to get uh, the material from the people, uh, from the insiders, uh, 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 saying then that, that we will give it to some institutional uh, archive uh, official. Um, uh, in case of libraries, it's it's more independent. It's it's more uh, we have kind of more network of independent libraries, and uh, but it's still it's uh, in in public libraries usually the zins are not very visible because uh, if they do not have special collections, they just get lost uh, in the in the whole uh, 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 collections of the of the, of the libraries. Uh, in case of collection uh, private collections, there's of course uh, no actually infrastructure it's just volunteering uh, and and networks of insiders when we speak about technologies and procedures in in within the uh, uh, archival paradigm it's highly regulated acquisition and processing uh with usually it means of course high costs and uh and in this case uh uh there is a kind of uh, lower chance to to digitize the material uh in in this context uh in in the context of libraries uh, 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 fanzines and zines need a distinctive cataloging and collecting practices and uh, uh, there's also a, a chance to a very limited chance to digitization in the collection collectors kind of paradigm uh, all of these technologies and procedures are low cost to do it DIY and and the results are low quality of course and and uh, there are limited metadata uh, and in the uh, 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 the third question about access in in the archival context, it's uh, from our point of view, it's very restricted with all of these regulations I mentioned, uh, 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 and uh, even more uh, regulation uh, or limit is is that that uh, uh, the digi digitization is is uh, not very likely uh, in in the case of official archives uh, in 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 what we know uh, actually and what we experienced in in Czech and Slovak Republic. In case of library, it's more open, but it's still the problem of low visibility uh, 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 if you don't have a special collection of funds. It's in in case of collection, uh, 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 private collection, it's of course very open, uh, but it's unstable. Usually uh, these Online platforms usually don't exist for for a long time, you know. Uh, it's it's activities of of uh, uh, individuals for, and if they don't have any time or uh, uh, other support, they they just uh, uh, stop to to do to the work and and so on, uh, and it's based on personal commitments and so on. So uh, to conclude. Um, we actually uh, came to to kind of compromise that we we uh, uh, our collection should be uh, independent uh, uh, kind of archive library and collection together uh, and to, with uh, because we we see that uh, we have to be very sensitive uh, towards the communities we we archive. Uh, 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 and I, I mentioned the reasons, but I can maybe say more uh, 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 within the discussion. But we, we uh, all of the uh, activities we do uh, are very, have to be very sensitive. And 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 uh, actually, the not the the paradigms I mentioned doesn't enable actually uh, in uh, uh, in in these cases uh, in our case actually uh, at least uh, these sensitive practices in collecting, maintaining, and publishing uh, this material. So that really, uh, 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 we found really barriers in all, all of these institutions. Uh, we try to get creators consent to to uh, uh, to collect or publish these materials, and we just really now uh, in 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 the process of trying to establish a, a, a physical uh, place uh, with uh, with uh, an archive library or collection uh, uh, where we uh, are planning to to uh, give. Uh, um, uh, individual access on 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 a personal negotiation it's uh, we think that it's it's a, it's a actually the the only possibility for now uh, uh for us because of the sensitivity of the material uh and and so on and we decided to 
uh, actually published something online uh, and I showed you the, the, the web uh, page uh, with kind of limited online access um, uh, with title pages of the fanzines and, and uh, a part of the metadata we have uh, that are uh, kind of anonymized. Uh, um, so that's uh, actually our experience, and I'm 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 really uh, looking forward to to hear your reactions and uh, and your um, ideas about uh, how to archive the subcultures. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Carol. Um, a wonderful and interesting subject. Um, um, uh, again, I ask, um, are there any questions or remarks for Carol? Nicholas? Uh, yes, hi, thank you for that, Carol. Uh, I, I really enjoyed it. I've, I have fond memories of, of the Riot Girl movement and zines, and uh, so it brought back a, a flood of memories. But I have a, a really simple, practical question. I'm afraid I don't have any answers for your, your the difficult problems you've posed to us, but uh, the thirty-year rule that you, you mentioned twice, I think. I know in, in the UK there's there was historically a thirty-year rule about uh, government needing to publish documents after thirty years, but uh, but I was struggling to figure out exactly what the thirty-year rule you were referring to uh, is all about. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, it's it's. Uh, I, I I didn't go into de uh, details because it's it's complicated. Uh, but uh, in in uh, just briefly, uh, no. In Czech context, is is a thirty year rule about access to uh, archival materials. So in fact, uh, in fact, for example, uh, the archival materials. Uh, about uh, Velvet Revolution in uh, eighty uh, in nineteen eighty nine was just released two years ago uh, for researchers. You know, it's uh, it's really uh, uh, very restricted. Uh, so it's it's if we will, would 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 give uh, this collection to archival uh, archive any you know official archive or something like that, uh, it will it would take uh, another like decade two decades most materials for 90s uh, 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 to to have it really uh, uh, available for research you know uh, and for for you know any any work you know so it's it's very restricted uh, in this sense uh, uh, of access thank you in one of the slides you mentioned uh, cooperations uh, with other uh, researchers of these zines, uh, Americans, UK, etc. Um, and did you mention that there was a, some kind of website or, or a database even with uh, with material? Yeah, yeah, we have our website with with a uh, 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 kind of registry and or database with uh, with basic information on our uh, fanzines and zines, and there are a lot of uh, like independent web pages. You know, I I've gave it uh, I gave uh, examples in the presentation. In case of Polish, for example, uh, fanzines, uh, quite a lot of them are there. Uh, in case of um, uh, I had, I'm not sure if what was but if. In a presentation, I, I had uh, examples of Slovak, of course, uh, and others. But these are really uh, uh, websites that uh, are usually maintained by by enthusiasts uh, in, in in this case. And and there are uh, uh, I, I, now I'm speaking about Europe and in, in the United States, it's much more kind of developed, you know, or institutionalized within uh, pr libraries, uh, public or university libraries. So you can find more, uh, uh, but it's it's about libraries there. Uh, so it's it's more catalogs uh, about them, and there are some initiatives uh, how to digitize and make make public uh, these zines. Uh, I uh, um, there is a quite uh, 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 mm, uh, vivid, I would say, network amount, uh, among uh, uh, feminist uh, 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 scholars uh, who, who deal with these riot girls' uh, uh, zines and materials, so uh, uh, working with the archiving of uh, feminist social movement. Uh, this is a quite interesting debate uh, 
uh, within feminist studies, uh, and they have also uh, have an online platform uh, for communication and uh, digitizing or sharing materials and so on. So, so there are quite a lot of them, but there are uh, scattered, you know, uh, uh, scattered internationally and, and usually, uh, you know, they, they have like kind of peak, <laughs> you know, and then they sometimes disappear or just, just uh, stay, you know, uh, uh, in internet and, uh, and so on. So, yeah. And, and in one of your last slides, you mentioned uh, limited access to um, uh, the, your material. Uh, mm -hmm. Limited is that in this in the sense that not everyone can look at it, or limited that um, the material you show uh, is limited in the sense that you only show the front page and some metadata. Uh, yeah, we, it, it, actually, in, uh, on our web page, uh, or, or I would say publicly, we share just uh, just the title pages and uh, uh, some part of metadata. Uh, but we, uh, of course, um, oh, of course, uh, we we um, ask people who are interested to to contact us uh, because we have also collection of some you know uh, physical objects. So and 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 uh, and the digital uh, digitized materials on our computer uh, uh, computers. So if somebody is interested in in studying these materials, uh, we individually uh, uh they individually contact us and we of course have to you know uh negotiate uh what are the uh, purposes and uh how uh, the people would use this material and we are quite open but uh in fact we uh we have come up to to you know uh, the position that this is actually the most sensitive way how to work with these materials you know um so so far you know uh the future is open uh uh maybe uh we would go uh the way how the the, the berlin's uh, archive which is i think very uh uh well organized and and so on and exists uh uh, uh for they started to this archive in 90s so so it has some history behind it. so i think it could be more institutionalized but at the moment uh uh, we we uh, uh, give the access on the personal basis, I would say. So it's limited. Okay, thank you. Uh, in the chat, there is a remark by Cleona, um, um, just paying attention, uh, asking your attention for um, the existence of the Cork Scene Archive. Okay. Uh, don't know if you already know it, but uh, she left uh, a link to to the website. Um, Thank you very any, much. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, is there anything you'd like to add, uh, Cleona? No, just adding it to your list, Carol. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah, uh, 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 yeah. I appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, I haven't I haven't heard about this this one. Uh, Thank you. Good. Any other remarks or questions? Uh, yes, Theo, I've got a question. Yes, mm -hmm. uh, okay, thank you very much for the presentation. It was very interesting. Um, uh, it reminds me of something we are trying to uh, uh, to work our way through uh, nowadays, which is uh, about um, a particular area in uh, Amsterdam called the Belmer, and about decolonialization of, of the Netherlands of Suriname. So there is a lot of material there that could be interesting and we are trying to make connections with uh, people. And uh, for me, I'm thinking more or less along the lines of uh, somewhere we trying to um, get a marriage between the best of both worlds. So if you've got that schema of yours on the, on the right corner on, with access, then with the collections, there is uh, some access, but it's open. And with the archives, it is limited actions. So I was thinking, and we are thinking more along of the line of a distributed networks. So people are still the owner and move away from ownership. So you've got the owners are the people who've got the information and we just want to have access to the information. And we try to facilitate uh, uh, this access and trying to make people aware uh, of the uh, rich archives they possess and try to get 
uh, things going along that way. So we no longer, I am no longer uh, interested in uh, trying to get the ownership of that stuff, but just get it out in the open. Is this something that you uh, considered as well? Yeah, that's that's very interesting. Uh, I think, and we 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 thought about similar questions. And in all ways, in these kind of communities, uh, I think this kind of kind of shared ownership is very important. And uh, um, and we. Um, we worked uh, with these people, uh, with the, the donors, I would say, of the material uh, uh, or, or people who just shared their collections with us and we, we digitized them and, and gave them back, you know, so, so, and, and these makes quite a lot of even personal commitments, you know, but, but uh, it's also ethical question that we, we, they gave us their kind of knowledge, uh, 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 not, uh, not physically, but, you know, uh, they shared uh, their experience, their life stories, uh, actually, and so on. So uh, this we uh, uh, think is uh, very important to, to have in mind and to and, and, and the idea. Yeah. And actually, we are going in the similar way how to how to, uh, you know, share uh, uh, share with the communities. Our problem is that we uh, actually uh, collect uh, uh, material from different uh, subcultures. And even from subcultures that were uh, like enemies uh, in nineties, you know, anarchists and and skinheads, for example. So in, in you know, we we even thought about uh, 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 making some platform more uh, like network with uh, and and getting uh, trying to get as much people as we can together. Uh, 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 but uh, in fact, we wouldn't uh, be successful in some cases because really these people were like fighting each other uh, from different subcultures. You know, there were quite tensions between different subcultures. So, so uh, it's not possible like this way. But still, we we try to uh, keep the networks uh, alive and 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 to keep uh, and and to have. Uh, uh, feedback, uh, 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 you know, continual feedback from from the people. Uh, so we have a, a Facebook page, for example, with with and trying to to you know uh, uh, communicate about our outcomes, uh, about anything, and and to share things and so on. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Thank you. Um, then. Um, we arrive already at the last uh, presentation for uh, this afternoon. Um, it's the presentation uh, by Dawa Selderust and Niels van den Kieboom. I'm quite sure that I pronounced their names right because they are Dutch colleagues of mine. Um, Dawa Selderust is manager collections and um, Niels van der Kiedeboom is a legal advisor and they both work uh, for the humanities cluster of the Royal Netherlands Academy of Arts and Sciences in Amsterdam um, in the Netherlands. And their um, presentation will be about access to collections and data, the general data protection regulation, uh, GDPR, uh, le uh, legacy data and the Meertens Institute. And of course, um, it's um, partly about this new European legislation and the impact that it has on access to collections and data. So, Dawa and Niels, um, the screen is yours. Okay. Th thank you, Theo. Uh, I'm going to share my screen now. Oh. Is this visible to everybody? Yes, it is. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, uh, thanks again, Theo. Uh, our presentation will consist of two different parts. Uh, first of all, I will start and tell something about the collections we possess at the Meertz Institute and give you a couple of examples. So you've got a general idea what kind of data we are talking about. And then Niels, he will take it over and go into the uh, legal details. Uh, at the Meertz Institute, we study Dutch language and culture. 
and we've also uh, collected information about Dutch language and culture. So we've been collecting information for over 19 years, more than 700 collections, about two kilometers of paper data, about 6,000 hours of audio recordings, and I will come back to that in a minute. Uh, it's got a uh, um, substantial digital collection and a library as well. Uh, of most scientific collections, the exact moment in time when collecting started is hard to determine. But with the audio collections of the Meertens Institute, we can pinpoint that exact moment in time. In the summer of 1931, Meertens, who later became uh, the director of the Institute, he went on an expedition to the island of Urk in order to collect, amongst other things, uh, dialect recordings. And here you can see Meertens, he's standing in the back uh, in the island of Urk with some of the employees and informants. Uh, this picture was also taken during that expedition. Uh, again, in the back, uh, there's an employee of the Meertens Institute. And up front, there is an informant sitting in a quite uncomfortable position, I might say. Uh, I think we nowadays we do uh, research uh, uh, quite differently, I hope. Uh, the apparatus that was used was not used to make audio recordings. It was used to measure, and I'm quoting here from the annual report, to measure the movement of the mouth and the lips. The actual recordings were made on wax rolls, as you can see over here. Um, and this is, in fact, one of the very first wax rolls at the bottom you can see. It's from the 5th of August, 1931. So uh, we've digitized this wax roll uh, and it contains uh, a small uh, Santa Claus song. Okay, I will let you listen to it in a minute. Uh, it's a very small, uh, very short song. It is in Dutch, it's a Santa Claus song. It's very screechy, it's cracky. It's not quite audible because we had to restore it, but it will give you an impression of the audio samples. Again, it's in Dutch, so no need to understand. Maybe the last sentence, he says, thank you, Santa Claus. Okay, here we go. So that was, thank you, Santa Claus. Um, later on, all kinds of audio uh, carriers and recording devices followed at the Meertens Institute. And we still uh, make audio recordings. Our researchers go into the field and make their audio recordings. Of course, there are lots of uh, GDPR uh, problems and personal data involved in this information. We've digitized the entire collection and we are trying to make this collection available uh, via uh, the website of the Meertens Institute. And currently at the Dutch dialect, database, we've got over a thousand hours uh, of audio recordings available. Uh, this collection is not only inter for interest of uh, linguists, but also historians, ethnology, etc., ethnologists, because uh, it contains a lot of history, a lot of stories, uh, etc. Every uh, collection at the MIT Institute has got also a metadata record in our metadata system. As you can see over here, this is a metadata record of one of the audio collections. Um, in this metadata records, we also have got personal information. So it is a problem uh, with the GDPR as well. As I already mentioned, we still um, have got uh, researchers that go into the field and make new audio uh, recordings. So not only we are digitizing our old researchers, our old research, but also we are uh, getting new research and new information, and we also acquire new collections, such as the Dutch Diary collection. Uh, now we work together with the Dutch Diary Association, and every week new diaries still come in. Um, so we've made a small uh, movie about this particular collection. I will show it to you just as a second example of the kind of collections we possess at the Meertens Institute. Okay, this is a small uh, movie we made about the Dutch diary collection. A 
Het Nederlands Dagboekarchief is opgericht in 2009 door Mirjam Niebuhr en mijzelf. Omdat er simpelweg zo'n archief nog niet bestond. En omdat wij het heel erg jammer vonden dat dagboeken en andere persoonlijke documenten vernietigd zouden worden. En ook dat we onze collectie graag ter beschikking willen stellen aan wetenschappers die onderzoek kunnen doen naar ego-documenten. In 2014 is de collectie overgenomen door het Meersens Instituut in Amsterdam, waar we heel erg blij mee zijn, omdat we zoveel meer zeker kunnen zijn van het voortbestaan van de collectie en omdat de boeken en de documenten zo ook beter geconserveerd kunnen worden. De dagboeken in onze collectie worden elke maand gelezen door een groep vrijwilligers. Zij noteren trefwoorden en informatie over de inhoud op formulieren. Dat gaat om informatie als wanneer is een dagboek geschreven, uh, Waarom is het dagboek geschreven? Waar is het dagboek geschreven? Waar gaat het over? En die informatie uit die formulieren, die noteer ik in een database. De database kan geraadpleegd worden door externe onderzoekers. Dus als zij onderzoek doen naar depressie bij huisvrouwen in de jaren 20, dan voer je die zoekterm in in de database en dan komt eruit rollen welke dagboeken in onze collectie daarover gaan. Thea's haar geknipt voor de warmte. Jammer, maar het Volka staat haar schattig. Vreselijk. Warm. Ik ben historicus en uh, je kan je natuurlijk bezighouden met allerlei grote uh, belangrijke maatschappelijke ontwikkelingen. En er zijn ook genoeg historici die dat doen, maar ik vind juist die uh, persoonlijke beleving van het verleden heel interessant. Ik denk dat je daarmee ook nog een ander perspectief krijgt op bepaalde ontwikkelingen. De collectie dagboeken past perfect bij het Meerdersie Instituut. Niet alleen vanwege uh, de inhoud en de onderwerpen die erin zitten, want we zijn op zoek. Eigenlijk naar bronnen die het alledaagse leven beschrijven. En dagboeken doen dat perfect. Maar tevens vanuit taalkundig oogpunt is het ook heel interessant. Er komt bijvoorbeeld geschreven dialect voor in de dagboeken. En de geschreven bronnen, de geschreven dialectbronnen, zijn zeldzaam. So now we are moving to the uh, second part of the presentation uh, about the GDPR and the collections of the Meerdersen Institute. Well, as you already saw. Uh, there are loads of personal data within the collections of the Meerts Institute. Uh, I just showed you two examples, but the other uh, approximately 700 collections, most of them have, have also personal data in it. There's also personal data in the metadata. So we've taken a few measures. Uh, we've made a disclaimer on the website, a privacy statement, of course, and we also have uh, procedures nowadays. So if there, somebody wants to uh, borrow a collection or use it, uh, we've got contracts uh, and of course uh, we have got support for our researchers and people who are trying to make new collections and finally uh, i would like to mention that we also have got within the humanities cluster a working group so we work together with other uh, institutes within the humanities cluster such as the huygens institute and the institute for war holocaust and genocide studies and the international institute for social science for social history and together we are trying to uh, tackle uh, the gdpr problems we have uh, niels uh, i'm going to give the floor to him in a second uh, he plays a vital uh, part within uh, this uh, gdpr working group and also within trying to cope with our uh, gdpr problems so niels uh, I'm going to stop sharing now, so you can take it over. Thank you, Dawa. Um, first of all, I would like to apologize for any background music you might hear. Like, as 1 p.m. sharp, my upstairs neighbors started blasting music when this meeting started, so that was uh, quite a shame. I'll uh, share my screen. Is this visible? Yes. Perfect. Yes. Right. Um, yeah. Thank you very much. As I've already been uh, introduced by uh, Theo and Dawa, thank you very much for that, by the way. Uh, my name is uh, Niels van Enkiboom. I'm a legal advisor at the Humanities Cluster of uh, the Netherlands Academy for uh, Sciences uh, and the Arts. And I uh, specialize in the GDPR and privacy. So I'd uh, like to tell you a few things about uh, dealing with the GDPR side of dealing with a fast collection of uh, all kinds of things containing personal data, such as uh, the metadata and collections of the Mertens Institute. So, 
So as Dow has already mentioned, the collections of uh, the Mertens Institutes are absolutely vast. They're chock full of all kinds of personal data, including the special categories which are more strictly protected, such as, uh, for example, religious and philosophical beliefs. For example, people's uh, opinions on uh, Freemasonry, for example, and other religious information, but that's uh, not nearly everything. Um, and there's also the point that a lot of this data was gathered in a time way before uh, data protection laws were this demanding as they are now. Because before the GDPR, there was the data protection directive in the European Union, which was a bit less strict. And way before that, there was even less protection. And as Dawa has said, the British Institute has collected information for 90 years at this point, which means that there is a lot of this so-called legacy data, which was gathered before the current demands of the European uh, legislators became this strict. And to deal with this, uh, the Merton Institute uh, employs both wide measures, such as the contracts uh, that Dawa mentioned earlier. When somebody wants access to uh, one of the collections, then we have to be careful about what we can share. And this will depend on who is asking permission uh, to use it, what they will use it for, under what conditions they will use it for. And more specific measures, such as uh, the blurring of text on publicly available uh, documents that are available online that would normally show uh, personal data, but which are blurred out on the publicly available versions. Uh, the processing, such as the collecting and storing and even granting access to this personal data uh, needs to be lawful, it needs to be transparent, and it needs to have uh, like specified legitimate purposes. And the purpose the Mertens Institute serves is, uh, well, conducting scientific research among other things and also contributing to the scientific environment of the Netherlands and maybe even Europe as a whole which is also uh, one of its assigned purposes under Dutch law. Uh, one of the biggest issues we, are, we have dealt with and are still dealing with at the moment uh, with these collections is that sometimes it is necessary to carry out a so-called data protection impact assessment. It's quite a mouthful, uh, DPIA. And these are uh, basically an assessment where you check which uh, risks the people whose information is in the database in this case, like what information there is in there and which risks are there for these people? Like, is there a big risk of identity theft or what uh, is there a risk of their, for example, their medical information's uh, being uh, becoming publicly available, which is likely not the case with uh, our collections, luckily, but it is uh, still a possibility in general. And uh, generally, you have to do one of these things before you start a new uh, project involving personal data, but because there is so much legacy data that we already have, that we still found it necessary to check whether our measures were sufficient to like guarantee a sufficient degree of protection for the people whose information is in like the Mertens database. And because of that, uh, we uh, are carrying out uh, these assessments ourselves. And it's very important that when doing this, uh, there's people that like really know the process, really know the project. And these people need to be aided by people with like the relevant uh, legal know-how, which is, uh, well, me and our organization and people with the relevant technical know-how, especially if there's a digital component to the archive and the database. Another important uh, factor that we are uh, dealing with, and that uh, we expect many other institutions will also be dealing with at the moment, are uh, is the fact that the GDPR gives data subjects uh, certain rights. And this is a very good thing. For example, they have the right to uh, have their uh, personal data, like to have access to their own personal data, so they can ask an organization, hey, what info do you have on me? And then that organization is obliged uh, under most circumstances to share that. They can request to have their personal data deleted or to have it uh, like adjusted to be correct if it's incorrect. And there's a few more of those. 
And these rights can also be invoked against uh, the Mertens Institute, which means that occasionally we can get a request uh, of a person asking, hey, which information, uh, what information do you have on us, on me, I mean. And then sometimes they also ask for it to be deleted. However, uh, the GDPR leaves room for uh, the member states of the European Union to make uh, exceptions uh, to these rights of the processing in question, such as the collection and the storing of the data serves a scientific purpose. Uh, the Dutch government has ruled that when uh, this data is specifically being used for scientific purposes and that measures are taken to ensure that this data is just being used for scientific purposes, then it is possible to deny such requests from the data subject. That doesn't necessarily mean that you will always want to deny such requests, but it gives you like the option instead of being forced to comply with it. And uh, this will vary uh, from member state to member state. So if you are in an uh, EU member state, you might want to check uh, what the case is for uh, your uh, nation in particular. And uh, that brings us to uh, the part where I ask you if uh, you have any questions. I hope you enjoyed our presentation and uh, thank you very much for listening. <clears throat> thank you very much, Niels and Dao. Uh, quite an interesting presentation. And I think, well, it's in the core of our theme. Um, people may have indeed some questions or remarks. Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Dao and, and Niels, for, for that presentation. That was really interesting. Uh, I, I just have a, a couple of practical questions again. The first one is how, how in the Netherlands is this term scientific purposes defined? Because it seems incredibly general, uh, and I can imagine there'd be some definitional, uh, definitional issues with that. And the second one is... Uh, and, and I'm aware of this ability under GDPR to sort of delete your data, as it were. How how would you do it in a traditions archive context where, for example, imagine I have two ballad singers uh, who are recorded and one of the two has decided that they don't want any of their information to be in uh, our archives anymore. Uh, do you have any sort of practical solutions? Have you encountered any situations like that? Uh, where you've got more than one contributor on on a recording, for example, and, and you have to somehow uh, get rid of some of the information while, well, hopefully keeping uh, the information of the person who, who hasn't requested to be deleted. All right. Um, when it comes to the first question, it is indeed a very broad term, scientific purposes. And I think that they intentionally left it uh, this vague. And it is a matter that will likely be uh, specified further as it often is in a case law when there will like unavoidably be conflicts about this. When uh, a scientific institution will uh, refuse a request such as this and the data subject will uh, uh, take them to court as it were, then they will probably be uh, more strictly defined. When it comes to uh, the example of the ballot singer, that is uh, quite an interesting uh, example um, do you mean just, uh, for example, a recording of a ballad sang by, sung by that person? Or does it also include metadata such as their names and some of their personal information, looking at it from a privacy point of view? Yes, I mean, it would, it would include metadata as well. Um, yeah. So the metadata is easier to, to delete, of course. Um, but I'm just wondering mm -hmm. in terms of, I mean, maybe ballad singers was maybe not the best example. I just made up an example, but an interview mm -hmm. where there are two contributors who are responding to questions and one of them has requested to be removed and the other one is quite keen to still be part of the archive collection. How do we deal with, with situations like this? That is indeed a difficult situation. Um, first of all, you can always try the traditional option of just conversing with them and maybe seeing if you can talk them out of it. And uh, if that, like, assuming that doesn't work, uh, it may be possible to, if you're looking at this from a GDPR and a privacy point of view, uh, to look to what degree it is possible to uh, anonymize uh, the interview in such a way that you can't really tell anymore that that person was the one participating uh, in the interview. 
because the moment that uh, the person is no longer recognizable, it will no longer count as personal data, which means that the GDPR does not apply anymore. Would another option Thank be you. that um, we keep the material, but there is an embargo on this uh, material for anyone to see uh, for, let's say, 50 years or 70 years. Is that, a, is that an option? Um, that is theoretically possible um, to some degree as well. However, if uh, there's an embargo, you are still storing it. And they also have the rights to uh, request deletion from the database as a whole. So an embargo won't solve that specific issue. But if they take issue with uh, it being public, then that might be a solution. Okay. Yes. And, and also, uh, Theo, from a, from a management point of view or from an institutional point of view, uh, this is something I uh, try to avoid since we are uh, an institute that collects information for research and uh, we try to make information available. So we are, uh, I don't want to say fanatic, but we are uh, open science. Uh, we've got an open science policy. And um, well, in the past, some, sometimes it happens that people offer our offer some stuff and they say, no, I want to have it on an embargo for 50 years. Uh, I generally uh, try to talk them out and try to explain what we do. And if that doesn't help in the end, um, uh, I suggest that they, uh, they, that they uh, try to find uh, a better place which suits their purposes uh, more than uh, an open science research institute. Okay, um, Nicholas, you said um, I have several questions, so um, maybe you have more than one now. Uh, well, no, no, it was just the scientific purposes. Okay. Was the first question and, and the other one was the second. Okay. Anyone else? Ava. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> in uh, Estonia, in Estonian folklore archives, we have a long term practice. So of course, uh, in earlier decades, uh, it was kind of a given that when uh, a researcher, folklorist went to field and uh, the informant gave the information on folklore and it was kind of uh, understandable that this is for the research. Uh, uh, but now we have had for several, several years now really a practice where we have contracts with our uh, collectors and, and the co-workers where they, they can state uh, in, um, as to uh, what degree uh, they want their materials to be public or if they want these to be private or if uh, they want some kind of a restriction, uh, some decades. Uh, so they have a choice by now. And also we're, we need to have this contract because we store a lot of the newer materials as well, as much as we can into our digital database. So the contract also has a point uh, where they have to stay, uh, say if uh, they give this uh, information to be published online. So, but still it's it's very, very tricky question like, uh, like Nicholas was asking because you have so many variables there and, uh, and uh, it's, uh, it's really, it's been a debate, I think uh, through several CF conferences and different panels where people are trying to find the solution between the the openness of the folklore archives because we are living archives and at the same time yes we have the the uh, legal and moral and ethical uh, kind of duty to protect people so it's it's a very very <laughs> very very tricky question but thanks mm -hmm. thank you thank you um so any more reactions? Um, if there are not, then I think we've reached the end of a very successful panel, I must say, with all kinds of uh, presentations that are really close to uh, the topic uh, that, we, uh, that we were dealing with today. Um, 
I wish you uh, a very nice uh, and a, a last part of the conference. Uh, maybe we see each other later today uh, with uh, the on the, uh, the the final party. But um, well, have a nice working day and uh, thank you all for participating and uh, see you around. Yeah, and then Theo, thank you for organizing and masterminding uh, the, <laughs> the topic. Yeah, thank uh, because you. Because it's it's really, I think it's very, very important to bring out these issues and then speak about this uh, archival ethics and, and accessing again and again, because times are changing extremely fast. Uh, all the data carriers are changing and, and all the uh, uh, ways to access information also change quite a lot. So I think this uh, this panel will have continuations in future conferences. So thanks to you. Thank you. Yes, most certainly. Yes. We'll talk about this another time again. <laughs>